cool. I, I can see people attending as well. Fantastic. Just give it a few more minutes. I'm just seeing the, the attendee list is going up. So I'll just give it another 30 seconds and then start. Fifth Agile Roundabout and our first virtual Agile Meetup. Um, it's great to get this meetup back up and running, and we hope to have news soon in regards to our next event. Um, and it's great to welcome so many of you back. Um, I've had messages today from people saying that they'll be watching in the gardens, part one person mentioned it, they'll be watching it from the beach. So I hope you can see from my face that I'm not jealous. A little bit, I promise. And um, so today we're, we're quite lucky to have three amazing speakers lined up, all of whom will be discussing their experiences of agile practices within their workplace. So first up, we have Jonathan from DZOM. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Um, then we have Rob from Catco. And then finally, we have Nick from iTech Media. So here at TRG, the day jobs recruitment. However, we're all passionate about the markets that we recruit for. And we hope these meetups serve as a way of giving back to the tech community. As per normal, any social media correspondence, uh, please can you use the hashtag Agile Roundabout. And the observant ones amongst you will notice a Q&A. Um, so you can ask any questions to the panelists. However, just like a Boris Johnson press conference, we won't have any follow-up questions. Um, so I'm sure all you guys are fed up of hearing my voice now. So I'll pass you over to... Jonathan at to certain. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and yep, you got the zone right. Very often some people say Dazen or Dazen, as my father calls it. Um, but yeah, the zone, the zone. So thanks, thanks. Good for being here. I think uh, I think I was at Agile Roundabout this time last year, or maybe yeah, sometime around this time last year. So um, I'm very humbled and honored that you guys invited me back so you can endure more punishment. <laughs> um, so yeah, just a quick little thing um, about me. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Lucky. Yep, my last name is Lucky. Uh, that is my surname. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm from the United States. I grew up in a little city, um, actually a big city called Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so uh, find it on a map. It's, a, it's an interesting place where it is. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working in both business to business and business to consumer software. Um, I've been involved in a wide variety of roles ranging from sales um, to marketing, product marketing, um, product management. Um, and in my current iteration of my life, I am an agile coach. So um, very exciting stuff over the years. And about two years ago, uh, I, I've been with the zone for about five years. Um, I transferred here about two years ago uh, from our offices in Charlotte. Um, a quick thing about the zone, if you don't know what the zone is, it's um, we are a live sports streaming platform um, where we stream a variety of live sports all over the world. Um, so we're in several countries around the world right now, including Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, Brazil, United States, Canada, Japan, so forth. Um, and our goal is later on this year, we'll be launching globally. So um, don't be surprised if you start seeing 
uh, the zone or your or you start watching the zone locally here in the UK. So very exciting to work in sports, um, and we're very excited to see sports coming back safely um, this year or relatively soon. All right, um, so. Let's jump right in. Um, one of the things is we're talking about um, uh, the theme of tonight being agnostic agile, and you're probably doing it already. Um, uh, one of the things that got me thinking about um, is about when we often think about framework or think about agile, we're thinking about the practices. So the frameworks, Scrum, Kanban, XP, Programmer Anarchy, Safe, Nexus, Scrum at Scale, whatever. and. Um, one of the things I got to think about as I was preparing this presentation is that in reality, um, we could follow every single rule in all of these frameworks. We could enforce every single practice. We could have um, the best daily standups. We could have the best uh, uh, sprint planning meetings. We could have a really cool looking, well-grained backlog. Um, we could have the very best cycle times. We could be increasing our velocity uh, 100% sprint over sprint. We could be hitting every single deadline, every date, exceed all of our OKRs, objectives and key results, uh, for those of you who don't know what those are, um, beat every, AK, uh, every KPI, meet every standard, and yet still, fail to generate frequent value to the customer in a creative collaborative environment. Um, so that's not to say that the stuff above um, is not important. Uh, I have meetings about this stuff all the time, but we always have to maintain a perspective that this stuff, all of the, the frameworks and the rules and all that stuff, all those things are supposed to serve our primary objective, which is generating value frequently to the customer. And how do, we, how do we sustain generating that value frequently to the customer? It's through having a creative collaborative environment. And so that's really, really key. Um, sometimes we get really caught up in the processes and the procedures and stuff. Um, we're really, we need to have our eye on the ball, which is generating that value to the customer. So I figured I'd share um, three stories in my experience in software development across my career. Um, that my kind that in, at least for me gave me a glimpse of uh, what like that really core bit of what agility is about, you know, not just following scrum exactly, not just um, doing having nice continuous flow on a Kanban board, but really that, yeah, we're really hitting that core of what agility is meant for to to um, a team and to a business. Um, so the first story I want to talk about is from a story of very, from very early in my Agile journey. And I, and in this time I worked for a company that was um, a business intelligence um, and uh, reporting um, uh, software company, so enterprise software. And uh, for much of the time there, the way we built software, we, we, we really believed we were an Agile company. Um, where some companies are on one end of the extreme where they have all they have every single bit of agile bureaucracy that you can think of from ever having like really, really like every single kind of meeting refinements, pre refinements and three amigos and two amigos and release trains and all this stuff. Um, we were actually on the other end of the extreme where we said well, we're agile. So we don't have, we're not going to have meetings, even though we're having a meeting in this video later on. This is when we started doing, do, be, working on our agile transformation. We said, oh, we're agile. We, we're not going to have meetings. Um, oh, you know, we're not supposed to bother developers. So we'll just give the developers, you know, this vague thing. And then we'll just kind of let them run with it for six months. And then we'll come back and see what they came up with. Um, and that's what we thought um, agility was. And, and, we, and we weren't getting the results as a business that we wanted. The engineers weren't happy. Um, and we said, you know, we need to make a change. And so we um, had had a, a quote unquote proper agile transformation. Um, we decided to do Scrum. And, uh, but we wanted to approach Scrum a little different from uh, how uh, everyone traditionally performs Scrum. And we all do this. My teams do this even today. Um, your, does your sprint planning go a little bit like this? You look at what the tickets that are at the top of your backlog, you guys go, okay, what do we need to get done? You drag in the tickets into the sprint and JIRA, 
and you go, okay, guys, is this too much work? Can we handle this? What else do we got to get done? All right, are we happy with all the work that's in the sprint? Is everybody busy? Does everybody have something to work on? You know, that's kind of how, you know, you that's how sprint planning works, right? And then everybody nods and you hit click start and then off you go on your sprint. The engineers pick their little, pick their individual tasks right out of the board and then off they go to do their work. Um, we wanted to approach it differently um, from that. So what we did is we said, we're going to just pick one user story from the top of our backlog, just one user story. And the entire team is going to focus and work on that one user story for the sprint. That's it, just one, just one user story for the sprint. Um, and what we did is we said, instead of saying, let's try and get all of the checklists done that's in the acceptance criteria of our user story, we said, well, we wanna look at that user story and say, what is the smallest version of that story we could potentially deliver within two weeks? Um, I think in this case, I think we ran two and a half week sprints. Um, so we did that. And then the team worked on just that story together all day long. So in some cases they mobbed, they did some mob and pair programming on those things. In other cases, they kind of broke down, broke down aspects of that story. And they said, hey, I'll, do, I'll take the data layer. Okay, cool, I'll work on the styling, whatever. By the end of the sprint, we also approached the sprint review differently um, from what a lot of companies do. So a lot of companies, typically you review, your sprint review ends up being a demo to your product owner, uh, um, or it tends to be a demo to stakeholders. Um, and that's usually what we always do because the customer is not necessarily available. Um, what we did is we said, actually, let's bring a customer into our sprint reviews. So our sprint reviews were to were with the customer. And what we did is we said that we took that one story we worked on, which in this case was schedule a crystal report automatically via email. And we said, um, hey user, what we'd like you to do with this tool is to schedule a crystal report automatically with an email. Now here's where the magic happened. This was where it got really exciting. So we crowd, so all, we crowded together. When I say we, um, the, the, the developers, the designers, um, the people in product, uh, even stakeholders, architects, whatever. We all crowded around the monitor because the user was on a WebEx um, and we watched the user use what we just built. So now this isn't doing this user testing sometimes six months, uh, this review six months after you've built the thing like we just built it, we just finished it, and we brought the user in to give it a try. And immediately the magic happened where individually the developers started noticing something was wrong. Hmm, hmm, that's not right. Or hmm, maybe we need to change that. And then the designer said, hmm, you know, the, the, the styling is not right there. Hmm, on this break point, it's not where it needs to be. Um, and then even the stakeholders who were observing it went, Ah, the user finds that valuable. Hmm, I wonder how we can sell that. So it created a, a whole interesting conversation. And at the end of the review, uh, in observing the user use it, we gathered feedback from the user and we also took our notes and we compared it all together. And that was our sprint review. And then we said, well, based off of that, and in this case, uh, what we found was that we gave that user the task, which was to schedule a crystal report by email. Um, we realized that the user kind of got lost in certain areas. So we said, well, how do we, how do we help the user not get lost? And so then we said, that's going to be the topic of our next sprint. So instead of saying, okay, we built the thing, okay, off to the next user story in the backlog. No, we said, okay, let's iterate. Let's improve on what we've just done. So we um, then took that work and we said, well, what if we created a, a um, checklist and uh, with that checklist, we will, that might help the user guide him uh, through, through the process. So that was our next sprint. We built the checklist. So the next re sprint review was um, we brought another user in and we said, we asked them the same question, except now the checklist is there. And uh, the user went through and they saw the checklist and then they start, we started noticing that the user would use the checklist as a guide, but they wouldn't know necessarily where the button was. So we said, okay, great. So now again, we said, well, how do we make sure that the user knows where the button is? And that was the user story. And that would be our next user story. So then we said, 
uh, what if when the user hovers their mouse over the check over the checklist item, it highlights the button on the screen. And uh, that was our next user story. And we built that in another sprint. And then we went that and we brought that to our next sprint review. The user, another user came in, we asked them the same question, schedule a crystal report by email. And the user did it, they, without any trouble. They went through the steps, they followed the checklist, they knew where the buttons were. And then after they tried it a few times, they knew exactly what to do. It was baked in their missile, into their uh, muscle memory. And that was it, voila, we got there. You know, and we got there in just a couple of sprints and we got something that works and works incredibly well. And then we moved on to the next story at the top of the backlog. So that's really powerful. Um, very often we tend to just go down this long path of building this thing, even when we're working in, 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 in quote unquote agile, but we don't necessarily do that important bit, which is really evaluate is, is the thing we're building, is it actually solving the user problem and, and answering that question as soon as possible? So the next story I'll share is uh, when I've worked with a website called Sporting News, which is also a part of the zone um, uh, some years back uh, while still living in the United States. And uh, it's a sports media website where we have all kinds of sports news and sports content, right? So. Um, one of the things we found was we got very weary of what I'd like to call the backlog schlep, um, where you're just going through ticket after ticket after ticket after ticket in the backlog. And um, we realized that, yeah, we're delivering, and yeah, we're delivering a lot of software, but it was beginning to feel like we're just churning out lots of code, right? So we said, well, let's take a break from that. Um, not saying that doing that is necessarily inherently wrong, but we, we wanted to take a break from that um, to actually try and let's see if we can solve a problem, solve some sort of new problem. So what we did is we created a one week sprint and we based this one week sprint on a book called Sprint by Jake Knapp. Um, definitely a book I would most certainly recommend uh, you all read and give a try. Um, and uh, what we said is we're going to pull all the right people in the room, all the right people. Um, not just the developers, the designers, who all exist in, in disparate departments in this case. Um, developers, designers, uh, you know, the product people, um, and we even had executive level stakeholders, you know, VPs, EVPs. And we all gathered together in the same room, and like as you see in these pictures here, and we wanted to not spend the next six months doing upfront requirements analysis and architecture and all these other things. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to say, we wanted to identify a key problem that executive stakeholders were really frustrated with and said, we want to spend a week and try to really give solving that problem that they're experiencing or that, that need that they have a shot. And it was awesome. The first, on day one, the executives really talked about the things that they really wanted and what they needed. And we really kind of tied that into the product about what we, what we could potentially do. And fo again, following um, Jake Knapp's um, book, everyone kind of did a little bit of a design clinic where we uh, came and sketched up a bunch of ideas. That's one of the pictures that you see there now. And everybody participated in this. So the engineers participated, the execs uh, participated, the product, the designers, everybody. And we ended up coming up with an idea that we all really, really liked that worked really, really, that we thought could be really, work really well, that we could potentially build within a very, very short amount of time. And so we did that. And we built a working feature, though very bare bones, within a week. When I say bare bones, there was boilerplate. Um, some stuff just had basic styling. Um, there were all kinds of things that, uh, you know, it was a little bit janky here and there. There might have been some mistakes. There were definitely some bugs, but that didn't matter. We just wanted to get this thing built in a matter of a couple of days so we could hurry up and validate whether this would work or not. Instead of spending months and months and months and months and months and months, doing all of these meetings, trying to, trying to plan out whether we think it might work or not. We just built it. And we uh, reviewed it at the end of the week. Everyone loved it. Um, the user we tested it on, we just kind of did a hallway test with some people that weren't involved in it. And it worked really well. And so then we turned to the executives who were involved this entire week because they sat there right with us. We said, hey, is this something that you want to continue? Um, should, we, should we try to productionize this? 
And they said, yeah, this is great. So we didn't even have to go back and try and spend the extra time and energy trying to sell it to executive leadership because they were already involved. They were already there. And part of that, of that thing was their idea anyway. And it was directly connected to a specific pain that the executives really wanted to see resolved. And so they said, yeah. So we ran and just two traditional sprints to productionize it. And it currently is a live feature on sporting news even today. In fact, I believe it's also on the um, on some editions of NBA.com as well. And that was, was powerful. We created a brand new feature that we that we didn't spend six months trying to figure out within just a couple of weeks. And we immediately reaped the value out of it right then and there. The final story I'll share with you guys uh, is um, something way more recent. And this is with uh, one of my current teams here in London um, in the zone. Um, and this is the, in case you're wondering, the video playback team. Um, so they're the people, we're the team that builds the, the player, uh, the thing you see when you're watching the game. So pretty important. Um, and one of the things with this team they said, guys, they, they came to me and they're a very mature team. They had been running Scrum long before I had joined them as, as their Scrum master. Um, and they, they said, you know, Lucky, we're, we're really tired of Scrum. You know, um, the meetings, uh, they, they kind of they suck. The way how we're doing the tickets and refinements and this, that, and the other story points, they're killing us, all that kind of stuff. And they just got really weary. Of, of doing that and they wanted to go to Kanban. And you've probably had this happen where um, your teams or you yourself go, we're so tired of all this overhead. Let's just go to Kanban. Everything will be easier if we just do that. And so I said, you know, let, you know, fine, let's just go to Kanban. Let's just do that. So we did. And we stripped away everything. So we stopped having refinement because we said, well, we'll just refine as we go. We stopped having planning because we said, we'll just plan as we go. We don't need to have that meeting. Um, we stripped all of that, all of our normal overhead and framework and process away when we were doing Kanban. But an interesting thing that happened there was that the same underlying things that the team was extremely, extremely frustrated about still remained. Um, so that means that it wasn't Scrum that was the source of the team's frustration. And it wasn't Kanban that was going to magically make the team feel better either. Because those are just tools that merely, um, that merely reveal your challenges. You really, it doesn't really matter what kind of framework you're using. Even when you're talking about at scale in an organization of having 30, 40, 50 teams across your uh, enterprise, if you don't address the underlying problems and challenges that your team or your collection of teams are encountering, it doesn't matter how well you optimize their process. It doesn't matter how well you run your scrum. It doesn't matter how fast your engineers can type. If, they, if you don't address the underlying problems that the team has, um, you're not going to get any better than you already are. So um, at some point at the beginning of this year, the team approached me and said, hey, Lucky, you know, we think we want to go back to Scrum. That's not my idea. Now, I never suggested to them to go back to Scrum. This was entirely the team's idea. And no, this is not me championing Scrum or putting down Kanban or anything like that. The team said, you know what? We want to use Scrum, but we want to use Scrum to make sure we reinforce certain practices um, and use it as a tool to reinforce certain practices. And that was really key. And the team voted unanimously to return to Scrum. But with new features. So we iterated on our process, our frameworks, just like you would software. Um, and we said, okay, well, well, here are the problems that we used to have. How can we use different things in Scrum to make those problems not exist? And so we did that. And um, we made sure that the meetings ran better. We made sure that the teamwork was a lot tighter. We made sure we held the engineers to the right level of accountability, but we also made sure we held the business to the right levels of accountability. Um, and so we used Scrum as a tool to give us the outcomes that we wanted. And we've been doing this for the last six months now, and the team has generally been pretty happy with it and a lot of the transparency and the things that it created. 
Um, will the team want to change this? Yeah, they may come back and say, hey, Lucky, we want to go back to Kanban for X amount of reasons. But before it wasn't just, we don't feel like doing refinement, so let's do, or doing sprint planning, so let's do, let's do Kanban instead. It's, we're going to switch frameworks because this framework is the best framework for this outcome or this practice that we want to reinforce. And they will likely change it again, and that's okay. We will likely modify it some more, and that's okay. Take the, take the core of what something is and then just slowly layer on what you think is useful and is going to work for you. Okay, so to wrap up with some tips, um, mix and match. Um, don't be afraid to mix things together. And you're probably already doing that. Very often we find um, people already mix Scrum and Kanban together already. Very often people mix things, mix Scrum and extreme programming together. Um, but also try to find more exotic mixes like um, Scrum and uh, Programmer Anarchy or mix in uh, Jake Knapp's Sprint model into there or maybe come up with your own framework. It doesn't matter. It just has to work towards your primary goal, which is just generating that or that value um, frequently for the customer. Whatever practice you decide to pick, just learn it and practice it well enough so that when you decide to deviate from it, you know why, you know exactly why you're deviating from it. Um, so that's really key. It's not about just abandoning it because you just don't feel like doing it. You're doing it because there's a very specific reason and it's giving you something by deviating from it. Um, and the same thing with your, again, going by modifying for the right reasons, same thing. It needs to reinforce the outcome that you want. If there's a rule or a pattern or a practice or something that is not reinforcing the primary uh, objective, which is frequently generating value, then maybe it needs to change. Beware of extremes. Balance is key. Um, if you, you don't wanna be too authoritarian and have too much process, but um, you also don't wanna have zero process or zero things. And you know, having too many meetings is a problem, but have, not having any meetings at all is also another serious problem. And when in doubt, just let the Agile Manifesto just be your guide. Um, if you're following the four lines of the manifesto, if you're aligned with the 12 principles as well, you're probably going to be okay, even if you're not following something perfectly. Let that be your guide and follow it. And just remember, just keep your eye on the prize, which is the most important part, is generating frequent value to the customer, right? If that's not happening, then you need to reevaluate your entire delivery model at a team level, at an organization level. If that's not happening, you need to reevaluate that. And you need to, and how do you sustain that? Is having a creative collaborative environment. So if you don't have a creative collaborative environment, any frequent value that you're trying to generate is not going to last very long. So uh, I thank you all very much. I hope you found these experiences useful. Um, and uh, I guess at this point, I, we all have questions, right? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And um, by the way, um, Rob and Nick, if you want to jump in or ask any questions, um, then feel free. So the first question was from Prem Kumar. Um, it's two questions. So firstly, what was your team's velocity? Um, the next question was, what technique did you use to prioritize items from the backlog? Ooh, good questions. And I'm assuming Velocity was probably talking about my first example with, um, with the team where we only worked on that one story at a time. So our first Velocity for our first two sprint, couple of sprints was like one, uh, one ticket, one user story. <laughs> and in their particular case, how we did estimation, because estimating and Velocity sometimes go hand in hand, we did an initial um, story points estimate across all of the major user stories we wanted to do. So it was like 20 or 30 of them. Um, and then we didn't really worry about points after that because they have served their purpose. We did an estimate and every once in a while we would reevaluate. Um, but in terms of velocity, for the first few sprints, it was literally one story. But as we kept going, we got better, right? So we got better at delivering one story. And so then we started being able to say, okay, we can do, if we were able to deliver one story and we were able to get that done within the first two days of the sprint, we didn't, of course, sit on our thumbs. We went, we were then said, okay, we're a little bit more confident now. We can pick the next story at the top of the backlog and work on that together. But only after the first one is 100 is done, right? So 
Um, that's how we scaled our velocity is as we got better and as we got better at solving the user's problems, we got more confident at completing a story early in the early enough in the sprint to be able to start a new start on a new story in the sprint. Again, that's not necessarily 100% Scrum compatible, but we found it was very effective at us managing what we could handle. Um, and every single time, we always had not just a working a working story at the end of every sprint. We had a working product at the end of every sprint, which was very powerful for us. Okay, I've got another question from Adam. Um, he said, how do you get buy-in from management? Frequently, I've seen that um, the immediate team are able to change, but the management layers both struggle to accept the change will add value. Uh, for me, I find that the only way to get the buy-in is to get them to see the results of it. Because if you, you could come up with all kinds of proposals and data and stuff, um, and, and the optimist in me would like to say, yeah, stakeholders would buy into that. But in my experience, um, you usually have to give your, your stakeholders something to point to. And so you got to create a success story. Sometimes that involves asking for forgiveness rather than permission and say, hey, we just went ahead and did this and look, see what we got you out of that. We can do more of that. So sometimes you just got to just do and just do it and, um, and, then, and then let it be successful. And then now you have something to point to. Um, to your stakeholders to say, hey, if we do more of this, you're going to get more of what you want. Uh, next question is from Vivek. Um, they mentioned in the third example, what was the underlying issue that was finally addressed when you went back to Scrum? Yeah. Oh, man. Whew. There were quite a few underlying issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, mainly um, it, was, it had to do with, A, making sure we one of the biggest things for us was prioritization. And actually that was, I think, the second part of someone else's question. So that actually reminds me to answer the two together. Um, prioritization was one of the fundamental issues because um, many, many companies like The Zone were growing very fast. We want to be able to do a lot of things and do a lot of things fast. But guess what happens is the magic word, the magic sentence happens when you say, oh, what's, what's the most important thing? And someone replies, everything is important. So we started, so we had to address that by A, making sure we really empowered the product owner um, to be able to make decisions about what comes first and what comes next. And the second thing that we did is we, we regularly had these, um, I guess you could say seminars or workshops, where we laid out all the big programs of work, we brought in all the stakeholders together, and we almost kind of did a poker game to decide um, what what was more important than the other. And we always emerged out with an actual prioritized list. The final thing is, is again, kind of getting sponsorship for saying, let's work in this better way. Is we said, okay, guys, let us work on just this first thing, this first program and let us deliver it. Um, and then you'll see that we'll get that one program done faster than if we were to try to work on all 15 programs simultaneously. And, and they let us do that. And they saw the results of that and it, and it worked very well. So that's how we addressed, that was one of the underlying issues we had. We had others even just kind of inside the team. But yeah, you gotta address those kind of issues and Scrum, Kanban, none of that stuff's gonna save you from those types of challenges. Okay, hey, thank you very much, Jonathan. We're gonna have to unfortunately move on now. Um, but so yeah, next, next talk um, is um, from Rob um, and he's gonna tell us about um, his his experiences at Capco. Thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me okay, sir? Yep, can hear you fine. Yep, I can hear you. Excellent. Uh, the cap's not obligatory, by the way. It just so happens that Lucky and I are really cool and we both work caps. <laughs> I'm also not affiliated to the Chicago White Sox. I just went on a holiday there once and I like the cap, so I bought it. I was totally going to ask. I was totally going to ask. <laughs> uh, I'm a football guy, unfortunately. Um, and Man City are playing tonight, so we can't overrun. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you to, um, to Beth, Phil, um, and the team for inviting me to talk again. Um, it's uh, always a privilege to come and talk to this group. So thank you very much for that. For those of you who 
were around for the last talk that I did, um, I did the very dangerous move of bringing my existing client who pays my bills onto the stage with me, um, risking getting fired, giving me insights for what was actually happening on the ground. And it was a case study on uh, scaled agile in reality. Um, but I think the interesting aspect was it was a completely business context with very little technology input. So it's how we were applying the frameworks to fit within that model. Um, the reason I'm saying this is the, the final part of the talk was on the effect that this change was having to individuals in the team, um, both, both on an individual psychology level and also how the dynamics between their teams were beginning to form and reform. Um, they weren't used to working in groups particularly. Um, they absolutely weren't used to working from a common backlog. It was a very siloed and distributed organization. Um, so what I wanted to do today really is, is pick up again on that topic because it got the most um, traction uh, on LinkedIn afterwards and there was a number of spin-off conversations that came from it and just focused really on observations I've had in the last few months since we did that talk um, on the impact that coronavirus has had now that we're all distributed in particular um, and some of the learnings I've seen come through not, not just from my main client but from across the client base that I regularly talk to at Capco about um, making agile work in a distributed context. So I thought I'd start off with a nice statistic from McKinsey, which is 62% uh, of executives believe they will need to retrain or replace more than a quarter of their workforce between now and 2023. Um, I've used this quite a few times in a number of client pitches that I've spoken to, and it absolutely frightens the life out of most of the execs that I, I get time with. The it's not just the thought of losing some of their workforce. Um, you know, we're all used to colleagues coming and going depending on their desires and what they're interested in doing. But I think what's particularly staggering about this is um, the sheer volume of people that will have to be retrained as well as having to be replaced. So we, we know that working according to the Scrum book or to whichever agile framework we take, there's a prescribed methodology for that. But I'm hoping that this most of you will resonate also with the sentiment that um, the majority of the time taking the book and applying it doesn't work and you have to make allowances for specific cultures within the organization, how people are, the dynamics between them. Um, some of the Q&A questions I was just answering then, you know, it could be constraints of the organization for how you work and making sure that you've still got some autonomy and flexibility. There is a continual learning path in the field that we all operate in. And um, I think the, the, the key thing then is this is testament that executives are starting to take note that the way that we operate as a group is in effect the new normal and the majority of the organization has to be prepared for it. Some of the challenges that um, we've seen come through, there's a, you know, a good, good report for state of remote working as there is for state of DevOps reports, state of agile reports. So if you, if you get a few minutes, I'd absolutely recommend having a read through some of these. What I find particularly uh, interesting, I guess, and surprising for this is if I look at some of the, some of the elements that were probably true pre-coronavirus, you know, taking vacation time, maybe working in different time zones, staying motivated. They were probably the key factors that were being pulled out prior to coronavirus as the main challenges um, of remote working, just facing the jobs full stop. What's become more apparent since then is the, the whopping 23% that prioritize unplugging from work or the 20% that say loneliness. You know, you add those together, you're talking almost half of the people who respond to the survey are finding it a challenge balancing their work life with their home life in this current environment and who knows when it's going to end while it was becoming a topic of interest to talk about personal well-being and mental health prior to coronavirus i think we need to do more very very quickly to accept the fact that people are struggling right now and it's not a, it's not an easy way to work and as practitioners of um, various different agile theories we are absolutely the best place to help people make that change and give them the support they're going to need from it So there are, there are three elements I wanted to talk through on this today. The first one is building culture and connection with your team. The second one is how you can turn commitment to yourself and to your team into actual habits. And then the final one is just a little perspective on um, at Capco, what we're seeing as the key dimensions for the future of work. So culture and connection. Communication, we know, is absolutely vital and important. Um, for those of you who've ever done any analysis on this, you'll also know that the majority of communication happens through body language. I think it's somewhere around 70 to 75% is, is usually the figure that people take. While we've got video conferences and you can see people's face and you can see their empathy that they're having sometimes, it's very difficult to do that on scale. 
So if I just compare now, for example, how I'm doing this talk to you today, I'm looking at my screen and a little green dot on my Mac, which is where the camera is. This time last year when I was doing the talk, I had 120 people in front of me and I could scan the room. I could see your interest, see when you're yawning, see if you're stretching, see if you're engaged by something I say. And it's that element of communication that we've, we're beginning to lose because of the environment that we're in. The long-term effects of that are yet to be seen. I'm sure there'll be some, some wider societal impacts from that. But for the time being, the, the key thing here is that we still need to be able to build trust with people, whether that's a new team that we've only just started working with or whether it's rebuilding trust with team members who um, maybe we're starting to lose a bit of touch with them because of the day-to-day -day interactions being lost. It could be your manager doesn't trust you to crack on with the work and you have to provide extensive visibility over all the stories that you're working on every single day. So three tips that we found that work particularly well is practice real empathy. So again, I'm sure you would have heard this before in many, many training sessions. It's not rocket science. When someone talks to you, listen to what they are saying. Actually take in the words they use, the tone that they are using, what they are saying, whether it's clear, if they're fumbling through it, is it a hard message they're trying to give you? Is it a happy message? Really listen to what they're saying and use that as the, the hook for engagement with them. Be proactive in the way that you ask people how they're doing. You know, it is typical as the as British people, when you start a conversation, you'll ask, how was your weekend? Wasn't the weather good? That might be sufficient for a face-to-face -face conversation, but when you are engaging with people in this remote environment, try and explore a little more. You know, if you know something a little bit about them, whether it's, you know, they have a particular favorite sport they go and like to do, rather than saying, didn't you enjoy the weather? Ask them, you know, did you enjoy, uh, you know, practicing basketball the weekend? Something like that. Show an interest in who they are as an individual. And then finally, um, and this one drives me absolutely nuts, is you do not have to be formal all the time. The number of uh, client pitches I've done for extremely large deals where the resonating feedback across all the different consultancies is simply you were too formal in how you went about your approach. Remember that even if the situation dictates certain levels of, um, I suppose, decorum for the meeting that you're in, um, you are still talking to human beings and human beings respond to other human beings. So find that balance between formal and informal to really build the trust for the people you're talking to. The next big bucket of challenge that we tend to see is productivity in the work environment. Um, it is an absolute privilege actually to see people on conference calls when they're actually within their own home. You get to learn something about people. Um, I've chosen the white background today just because that's my, my uh, preferred style when I do presentations but when this is not here you'll see behind me um, a library full of different sci-fi books. Um, I don't mind people seeing that when I'm in um, smaller work conversations because it, it lets them know something about me and it always strikes up a conversation with them about who I am. Um, I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to do that in my little office and I have my own desk and reserved area and that's what I need to help me be focused in what I do, my own little quiet space that I go to. I recognize at the same time, that's not the same for everybody else. Some people prefer to have, um, you know, working spaces in the kitchens. They might be in shared houses. Those of us who've got childcare, you will have children running around who will interrupt your meetings or bang on the door. You might have pets. You might be back in the office and be the only person there. And it's, you know, your voice is echoing around the corridor. There is a variety of spaces that people choose to work in. Um, the point behind this is you need to find the environment that helps you and make a real change to keep that sustainable, that you're able to work productively. There are a variety of methods to be able to do this. Um, one little one that I've heard of, which is quite cool, is the Pompadouro technique. Um, basically, it's setting yourself a rhythm and a pattern where you have a focused bit of time that you work on something. You take a short break, you focus again, you take a short break, you focus again, and then you have a longer break. So it breaks down your daily work routine, either into the, you know, the smaller stories that you've got or whether it's something bigger, it keeps you ticking over on a nice pattern. Um, my biggest flaw with remote working is I just forget to take breaks because I get so engrossed and involved in what I'm doing and I have to consciously set myself timers on my phone to say, you need to take a screen break now. Self-care is equally important. Um, again, I prefer to play music when I'm working. Um, I don't want interruptions, but depending on the type of work I'm doing, I'll either put a heavy metal track on or sometimes I'll put some classical music on. Um, both of them help me think and concentrate in different ways. Um, I will always get dressed for the day in the morning for work. Um, I'll never do it in pyjamas because to me, there needs to be a step change away from my home life to my work life when I come in the office. 
Um, I know a lot of people who are much more active than me and they take great pride in that and they, they block out their calendar and they are refusing to do meetings before 8.30. Um, whilst most of us could probably do earlier because the commute have gone. Um, I admire them for what they do to ring fence that time in the diary to say that this is me and what I have to do. There's a lot of ideas here for things that you can do with people to show them around. Um, I haven't seen all these happen, but I've seen recipe shares happen on some of my client sites. Um, the MTV crib style video tour is a particularly good one. If you're in a safe team, that can always be a nice thing to do. Um, the chat channel with uh, pictures of pets has actually been a resounding success on the client account. I've seen that used. Um, there are all sorts of weird and wonderful pets that people had that I just had never idea you would do. Um, but I guess the point is, think about who you are as a person and how you want to reflect that into your work life. Um, I'm not saying that you have to be 100% uh, individual and personable in everything you do, but it's not a problem to let a bit of your true personality and character show. So it's all well and good saying that, but I suppose the challenge is how do you actually make it stick and turn uh, ideas and interests into a habit that actually makes you work better? Um, I've borrowed this wonderful formula from a colleague of mine called uh, Casey Schaefer in the US um, who does excellent presentations on this topic. So if we think about big things that we have to change, like, you know, I want to learn a new language and move to France, right? that is a big goal that is unlikely to happen tomorrow. But what you can do is make tiny habit changes and behavior changes today, which will stick for tomorrow. A lot of this is rooted in deep theory. Um, to give you an example of something that I've done for myself with this. So behaviors are essentially built of three components. There's the motivation to want to do something. There's the actual ability to be able to do it. And then there's the trigger or event that gives you the impetus to go off and do it. So for me, uh, as I just mentioned with the reading, um, I, I rarely get the chance to read at the moment because when I get back from work, I'm exhausted and I just want to play with the kids for a bit and then go to sleep. So I have a motivation still because there's nothing I like more than going into a classic sci-fi novel and, and you know, reading the whole thing cover to cover. Um, I know I've got the ability to do it. I might not be the best and quickest reader in the world, but I'm able to get through a couple of chapters a day. The challenge for me was the trigger and finding that moment where I would actually sit down and do the reading. So one of the tiny habit changes I changed for myself, um, my usual routine would be, as I said, come home, play with the kids, bath time, bedtime, and then usually about 8.30 and maybe 8 o'clock, um, I'll be able to come downstairs and that's kind of my day finished. Um, I'll always go to the kettle and make myself a tea or a coffee. So what I've started doing is rather than making that and taking it back to the lounge where I'll sit down and watch something on TV, I'll put the book that I want to read next to the kettle. So that when I go and make myself that tea as part of my routine, my trigger is in front of me and I'm like, ah, okay, I'm now going to have a half an hour or an hour window. I'm going to take my book and I'm going to read it. And just making that slight change to my environment and where my things are has let me take on this new behavior. I would encourage you all to think about what that is, whether it's, you know, I drink too many beers in the evening. So if that's the case, take away the coffee table next to your seat and then you've got nowhere to put your cup. If it's the exercise routine and working out at 6.30 in the morning doesn't work for you, make a note to do it at lunchtime. You know, find a time or something that's going to help you do what you want to do. A couple of small ideas there. I wouldn't recommend the ice cream tub. I don't think that's going to help any of us at the moment. So just to wrap it all together, from a, uh, a consulting perspective, and the majority of work that I do day to day is advising clients on uh, usually taking small agile proof of concepts and working out how they can scale that across the business using whichever framework is going to be, you know, scale agile framework, Spotify, less, dad, um, you name it, it always tends to be a blend of it. But uh, broadly through the umpteen chats I've had recently, there are these four uh, buckets that people are thinking about for the future of work. Um, the first one is the way of working that people actually have. Um, Lucky, I thought it was just fascinating listening to your talk before about how you made your agile team work and function. Um, you know, the way that you operated and chose to lift elements of the agile book and add in your own elements to make it successful for your context. That is exactly what this is about. Find a way that works for you and your team, even if it's slightly against the grain. If it works for you, go ahead and do it because you're going to produce more value and you're going to step further ahead by doing it that way. For physical space, I know we've talked a lot about personal environment today. Um, but if we think more holistically about office buildings, for example, we could start to reimagine the way our office space is used. So if we move away from hot desks and just having a co-located team, I've heard an increasing number of clients talk about having uh, a single collaboration space where 
people will go into London or whichever city is going to be to do work together. And aside from that, you have a work from anywhere type mantra. So we're going to do some significant changes to the way that our offices are laid out. As far as technology is concerned, um, I love technology to pieces, but when it comes to doing this kind of work, my mantra tends to be pick the tooling that works and just get it done as quickly as possible. Um, I get frustrated by hanging on technology as the conversation point, because to me, it's an enabler. It's not the end of the conversation. So my, my steer on this is take the tooling that you need to be able to fill your job try and make that a standard pattern across your team so you're all working from the same hymn sheet and move forward and of course the final one is the one that we spent a significant amount of time talking to today and this is about the people within your team think about what it's like working with them today what you can do to change to really lift up people's moods start to spot and even understand where they are at the moment and then as we look to the future and hopefully um you know reuniting with colleagues uh, across the world in in uh, hopefully not too distant future anyway Let's think about what that relationship is going to look like in the future. Um, undoubtedly, things are going to change and you might not feel comfortable going up and giving that person a hug anymore than you would have done on a Monday morning. What is the other thing you could do? You know, could you bring them a coffee from Pret and leave it on the side just to show your token of appreciation to say, it's good to see you again. Thank you very much for listening today. Thank you very much, um, Rob. Um, does anybody, quickly before we move on, does, does anybody have any questions? Um, do any of the other panellists have any questions for Rob? Uh, yeah, I actually have a, have a question for you around this because I, it, I think it's very important and very relevant to talk about what's the future of how things are going to look. Um, and, and I think some things will fundamentally change. Um, how have you ever had any experience um, with everything being remote and online recently um, with getting that kind of magical aha moment uh, when people are kind of together, when they're like working on a whiteboard together? If you remember back in the day, we were in the office, people would work on a whiteboard together and you'd see that interaction happening. Um, have you in your experience uh, managed to see or facilitate that same kind of feeling happening with everybody being remote? Yeah, it's, it is absolutely harder to get to that point. Um, but getting that aha moment in workshops is, is absolutely key to the job that I do day to day. Um, I think the most successful setup I've done for this and this, you know, speech to the tooling thing I just said before, the one I tend to use is one called Mural. So it's, it's quite cool for being able to jump in and jump out and around this big canvas so you can take people's thoughts here, there and everywhere. Yeah. What I like about it in particular is you can you can basically partition the topics that you want to talk to people about. And we always include something which is, you know, your thoughts or your feelings or something that's resonating with you as you go through. So if you have like a dual hat facilitator, co-facilitator role, mm -hmm. the co-facilitator can constantly keep on top of the comments people are making about what's resonating and you can adjust the conversation on the fly and constantly jump to things that people want to know about. So if you're a little bit more sensitive oh. to the mood in the room and what people want to talk about, it, it tends to be easier to get that aha moment in my mind. Ah, okay. That's an interesting one. We literally here at the zone, we just started trialing. We just started a trial of mural today. So, um, uh, yeah, I'll give that a try. Yeah. yeah sure. Thanks. I don't work for mural, by the way. There might be other ones. <laughs> <laughs> not mural and not the white socks either. The coat came down. I'm all set. Well, thank you very much, Rob, for that. It was, it was really um, interesting, and, and I'm sure um, what you're saying will, will, will help many people and, and resonate with many people as well. Um, so the, the, the final talk we have is um, from Nick Walker um, at iTech. Um, interesting to hear um, his, his approach to agile principles and practices where he's been. Um, so without further ado, Nick, I'll, I'll let you take over. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got the, uh, the baseball cap. I have got a headband because like, I think a lot of people haven't managed to have a haircut in the past three months. So I have to apologize for that. Um, and as is a bit of a tradition as well, uh, cheers, everyone. Thank you for showing up tonight. Uh, really appreciate uh, the guys at TRG putting us all together. So yeah, here we go. Hmm. Um, so we can kind of talk about like why you're probably doing this right already. Um, so first of all, uh, I'm Nick Walker. I'm here because I love to give presentations, of course, and from the safety of my own home, it's even easier. Um, but what I kind of want to focus on a little bit today is not just about 
uh, some of the things that you know Rob and, and Jonathan have been talking about, but also how to develop you as a person. Like we're all agilists, and something that I've spent uh, a lot of time thinking about in the past couple of years as I've kind of got into more leadership positions and and so on is how to help all of you become much better at what you do. So uh, you can find me at Nico Walker, and of course you can always stalk me on LinkedIn. But um, there you go. Um, now the topic of, of agnostic agile and kind of why you're probably doing this already, like why does that even matter? Like why are we talking about it? So I want to share with you some some examples of things of why it probably does matter. So let's talk about jobs first of all. Now uh, there is a bit of a silver lining, I think, sometimes to companies like mine that are fully remote and can recruit. Um, but I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are currently looking for new work. So let's kind of imagine the scenario for a second that you're looking for a new scrum master job and you know your interpretation of scrum master hits a certain criteria but i was looking at linkedin today and i came across a couple of job specs the first one here take a couple of first bullet points okay cool looks good right responsibilities yeah okay this is another one that i looked at i pulled again a couple of them out what i want to get you focused on is these two in particular one Facilitate Scrum events to be purposeful, effective, encourage continuous improvement. Second one, responsibilities, all planning around effectiveness, repeatable sprinting uh, for a long running team, refinement, sprint planning, sprint ceremonies, quality and deployment. Uh, and I appreciate, you know, some of the wording in there is, is kind of whatever, but that essentially implies that you as that Scrum Master will be facilitating running those ceremonies. And I think for a lot of us, that would be pretty common, right? Um, but if you look at scrum.org and you look at the official, what a scrum master does and what it does for a development team. So this is kind of the, uh, the text taken from, from the scrum.org website, you know, the founders of scrum. They talk about facilitating scrum events as requested or needed. They don't say it's a mandatory thing. They don't say it's something that you should be doing as requested or needed. I think it's a really important distinction to make how, you know, even something that is you know, specifically called out as a specific job role, such as Scrum Master, has such a different distinction in terms of what it is going to do and what it isn't going to do. And I think the reason why I'm kind of pointing this out to you all is because depending on your organization and the way that it defines what that job role is and what the job specification is, it can massively change kind of actually how that kind of affects your kind of customer impacts and the way that you're working, your philosophy, that your values, just purely or something as simple as that. So let's kind of think about some of the questions of, of, of why that has an impact. What are the expectations? Is that hands-on role, hands-off role? Do you facilitate? Do you coach? Do you guide? Do you lead? I don't know. But what's actually important? Is it a process or an outcome? In neither of those first job specs did it talk about what the purpose or the why was. You're going to facilitate these ceremonies. Great. They're going to be wonderful ceremonies and, and much like my kind of uh, um, presentation fellows, uh, you know, saying very similar things. It's like, what's it actually about? Like, what is the kind of importance for this? Um, something that Ken Schwaber wrote, and I love this uh, because it uses the word flaccid. Um, usually this would be the crowd. And as Rob said, you'd kind of hopefully gauge a, a bit of a reaction and a bit of a laugh. But um, there are many instances of flaccid scrum teams where they're using the Scrum vocabulary, but weren't able to create a potentially shippable increment or functionality within a single sprint. I think that's really, really important. I think that that quote is lovely, not just because of the flaccid part, but because you've got a job spec where some of us will be going to apply for these jobs. You have organizations that say, we're gonna track this talent. We're going to have these people that are gonna join us and they're gonna do these things, but actually don't necessarily line up with the original intention of what it is. But it's also about what they don't say. Something kind of as part of doing this talk and you know, having done this for, for a long time now, you know, people look at the, you know, even the Agile Manifesto and you know, the millions of books and the you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of organizations that provide training and about how they do this. But a lot, of it, a lot of it is about what they don't say. So I want to kind of shake some, uh, some perceptions maybe and talk about Scrum and Spotify. So this is another thing is like when I wrote this, I didn't kind of necessarily consider that I can't have people's hands up. So you have to kind of bear with me here. 
But on scrum.org, so this is uh, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland's uh, website. So they, for those that don't know or aren't familiar with the names, uh, they founded Scrum. They kind of came up with the idea of Scrum and, and they make millions and millions of dollars kind of on this. But they've got a community forum. And I love this because I, I looked into it. It's something so, so simple. Um, in the Scrum guide, it talks about the optimal development team being three to nine members. I was talking to someone about this and they said it was seven plus or minus two. And then I replied, it's three to nine. And apparently I was wrong because that's not what the guide says. The guide says it should be this and I said this and I was told that it's wrong. So what is the correct size for a team? And it kind of made me chuckle a little bit because there's always that argument of like, why does it even matter? Like why is someone having the conversation about what size team works and what size team doesn't by an arbitrary rule that doesn't have the context of the problem they're trying to solve? And again, thinking about those job specs for a second, it doesn't think about what the overall purpose is. Why do you need a team of plus or minus, like seven plus or minus two in the first place? Is it because you're trying to do something really big? Is it because you're trying to meet a certain goal or an outcome? Like who knows, it's not even part of the conversation. It's just an arbitrary rule because a guide says that you need to do this or you need to do that. Or, you know, Jeff Bezos says that you need to have, you know, teams that can be fed by, you know, no more than two pizzas. Like, Actually, what's the context in there? We kind of look at these things and, and hold them up as this really uh, almost biblical uh, text that is kind of guiding us in the ways that we do things. And actually, even kind of here in, on, on the Scrum.org website, you've got someone having you know, a discussion about team sizes. Really, really kind of odd. But I also kind of know, I mean, I know the Scrum Guide quite well, as I'm sure that many of you do, but any guesses into, and again, the audience participation thing's not going to work here, so I'm going to fill in for you. But what does it not mention? You think you scrum, you kind of go, yeah, we run scrum. So many companies out there say, yeah, we're agile, we run scrum. We do that, we kind of, we have stand-ups, we have this, we have that. But did you know that in the scrum, official scrum guide, so if you go and trained by Jeff Sutherland, who I know kind of spoke at Agile Roundabout last year and was, was absolutely fantastic and I've got huge amounts of admiration for him. Doesn't mention user stories once in the whole guide. Doesn't talk about user stories. Not in there. It also doesn't mention velocity or any productivity metrics for that matter. Doesn't talk about them. And yet I'm sure that many of you, either through personal experience or talking with colleagues or anything like that, will say, yeah, we run Scrum. Or you go for an interview, yeah, we run Scrum, we're agile, we have user stories, that's part of your job spec, that's part of the thing that we have and kind of the artifacts that we have. And we talk about velocity, we care about velocity, that's what, Scrum doesn't mention it. Is that a good or a bad thing? I'm not quite sure. But what it does kind of highlight is that most of the time that these guides or these uh, you know, official certifications, these you know, things that we kind of look to to help shape our teams and help shape the way that we work, don't necessarily have all the answers. And much like I think both Rob and Jonathan kind of alluded to, you know, bringing in that mixed match of things that are gonna help us achieve this is actually the right way to do it. And hence the kind of title of the talk, you're probably doing this right already. Spotify model I think is another fantastic example. And it's something that I've been fortunate enough to uh, have hands-on experience with. I've been to a few talks by people that, you know, were, were agile coaches from the very early days of Spotify. Um, I've also met and, and spent time with Jimmy Jamlin, who is, you know, now selling himself and, and doing very, very well as a consultant kind of place this. And I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Spotify model. Um, essentially, for those that, that don't know, it's, a, it's an organization and, and management system for, for how uh, we should be structured. It talks about tribes, squads, chapters, guilds um, as a way of organizing people around work and, and functions within a company. Um, for a lot of years, it was very much considered to be the, uh, oh my God, Spotify is growing and scaling and it's doing wonderful and it's kind of going uh, onto the stock exchange and people are making lots of money, we should copy them. Um, and the Spotify model was kind of seen as one of those ways that they could do that because they published a white paper about it. But here's a lovely quote from, uh, from Joachim Sundan, who was an agile coach from 2011 to 2017 at Spotify. And he said, even at the time we wrote it, we weren't doing it. It was part of an ambition, part of approximation. People have really struggled to copy something that didn't really exist. And I find that absolutely amazing. And I've, as I said, I've been fortunate enough to spend time uh, with some people from Spotify. And they've said this all along. It was never intended to be something that people should copy. 
it was meant to be something to attract talent and it was meant to be something to kind of let some light into what was going on inside the company and, and kind of expose some of that. And yet there are people out there that will sell you the Spotify model. Um, and it didn't take too much time to find um, kind of training institutes. And I'm sure there's kind of many more consultants out there. And, and thankfully it's drifted off the past kind of couple of years, but there were people out there that will sell you the Spotify model. Yet you have people from Spotify, some of which probably were uh, quite instrumental in creating the model in the first place, telling you that it's not something that you should do. And there are consultants out there that will, uh, will sell you it. I think uh, definitely in the wrong, wrong job for me, because I'm sure they've made a shit ton of money uh, doing it. Well, the two things that, are, again, kind of the two examples I'll give you is, you know, you've got this kind of scrum master job roles that are coming about. The scrum guide saying not necessarily the same thing. And I realize that there's a bit of interpretation in there, but kind of different things in there. Um, and then you have, you know, two very clear examples of, of something that, you know, sometimes get bundled together, like scrum, user stories, velocity, not the same. It doesn't actually, it's not part of it. Spotify model, people look to it as a thing that they should be aspiring to, trying to achieve, trying to perfect. Not really a thing, not something that people should be doing. So probably why, and, and kind of one of the things about this is I want to, you know, back to my original point about why I want to push this point to all of you is I'm sure that for a lot of you, you're probably doing this right already. You are successful people in what you are doing. You're, you know, doing very well. You're kind of helping your teams achieve things. Um, but there's still that kind of strive. And I see this in a lot of people. I, I've, I've interviewed dozens of people over the past month as my team is growing. And you, you kind of meet people that talk about trying to perfect that process, trying to perfect, you know, that uh, methodology or framework that they've been trying to achieve and really forget the essence of what this is all about in the first place. It's about being contextual and agnostic, I think. But actually, none of this matters for a second, right? Because even me talking about all of this and preaching about how Spotify isn't right and Scrum isn't right is feeding into all of that. You know, I'm talking about how Spotify is a thing and not a thing and Scrum is a thing and not a thing. And I'm actually kind of feeding into that because I'm not emphasizing what's important in the first place. So let's think about this. Are you helping your customers? Is your team delivering? Again, the audience participation thing. I should have thought about this a lot more before I wrote this. But I'm sure if I was to ask every single one of you face to face and say, are you helping your customers? Are your team, is your team delivering? I'm fairly sure all of you would say yes, because in some capacity, you are helping make that happen. And in some capacity, you're achieving that, whether it's fantastic or you kind of give yourself an eight out of 10, nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 of, of how you're doing that different thing. But are you helping your customers? Probably. Great. Wonderful. Is your team delivering? Yes, it is. We are delivering something. Could we be better? Absolutely. But are we delivering? Yes, we are. Are you providing value? And I think, you know, again, kind of both my uh, um, compatriots in kind of presenting today, you know, talking about that value. Is your business working? You know, are you hitting those, um, you know, KPIs, OKRs, kind of whatever it is? Like, are you working towards that? Yes, probably. In which case, why do we kind of get so wrapped up as kind of practitioners in our, in our craft? about why we're trying to strive towards Scrum or why we're trying to try to strive towards these things. And that's really what I want to challenge all of you today to, to really think about what the essence is of what you're all actually doing. And not only that, but certainly, you know, there's a question before about senior management. What is it that we're trying to do? Well, we're trying to provide value to customers. We're trying to make our business successful. Well, then why are we trying to hit certain methodologies or talk about Scrum in certain ways? It's about these things. And, you can achieve that in a million, million different ways. State of Agile 2020, I think, is really uh, a great report. And I think Rob kind of alluded to some of these. Um, it's been going for about 14 years now. And uh, the, the 2020 uh, report came out uh, earlier this year. Um, it talks about um, lots of different things. But one of the things it talks about is Agile adoption, some of the reasons behind that. Um, and to give you all a, an idea, this isn't just a kind of a small sample size. It's about 40,000 agile executives and practitioners, you know, across the globe, primarily Europe and North America, but also increasingly in Asia and, and APAC. Um, but I really love this metric because it's how success is measured with agile projects. Business value delivered, customer user satisfaction. 
46 and 45 percent of people responded said that was the thing that they were using to measure success at projects. It's amazing. But third on the list, unfortunately, is velocity. And who gives a shit about velocity? Like, really, it's a great metric to help like drive your teams and, and maybe kind of help them understand the work a bit more. But the essence of it, business value delivered, customer user satisfaction. And that's how we should think about these things. It should get us away from the idea that we have to follow Scrum or Scrum says or Spotify do this and we should follow Spotify because they've had success. What's useful for us? What's the context for us? And how can we be agnostic in our approach to best achieve that? So let's do something else. As a group, as agile practitioners, let's do something else because it's never going to be perfect. And I think that, and I, I know that I personally suffer from this quite a lot, is, um, you know, you kind of look for those uh, absolutely perfect processes. Oh, I've got this idea in my head and I've, I've built out a lovely kind of board and flow chart and it's going to look like this. And I'm going to have all these artifacts and things that's going to happen. And then two weeks in, it doesn't work or something has to change or something kind of goes awry. It will never be perfect, but what actually is the point of you doing it in the first place? It's to achieve that customer value, it's to achieve that you know, business value, it's to please your customers, it's to make a difference to, to those things that you're going to do that's going to outline your kind of business's success. One of the things, and I've used this uh, a couple of times, you have to excuse me for opening another beer because the, the one's on the uh, People may have probably heard about Kaizen. It's the idea of you know, continuous improvement, but I really love this and I can't remember where I found it from, but um, I've kept it on my desktop as kind of a quick, uh, quick referral. But it's the idea of making the rule, follow the rule and improving the rule. And, you know, I think Rob kind of referred to this as, uh, or maybe Jonathan was talking about the Agile Manifesto. And actually, if you look in there, there is, and the same with Scrum, it's not about what they say, it's about what they don't say. That flexibility that you have, that autonomy that you have, that context that you should try and follow. Um, about what it is you're trying to achieve and how you're going to achieve that and how you should continually adapt and innovate on the techniques and frameworks that you have. And look, not all of us are going to be lucky and fortunate enough to come up with the next Spotify model, you know, for as much as I kind of shit in it or, or found a new methodology and, and have a huge industry behind it like Scrum and the certifications that kind of go with it. And, and let me tell you, that is a multi-million dollar industry. But certainly for our context, and we know this better than most people because we're the ones working in it, what works for us? What works for our customers? How best do we tie those two things together? And actually, I think that the idea of taking something, following it, improving it, that's something that we should really kind of learn from. So I want to kind of leave you with a, with a kind of a few uh, things that I think are really tangible. I kind of personally like talks that are always very tangible towards the end. So I want to kind of leave you with these, with these thoughts. If there was ever a screenshot that you're going to take, this is it. Challenge. I want you to all go away and I want you to make sure that you challenge the people around you. So when someone defines agile as a tool or a process or a framework or uses the phrase, oh, well, Scrum says, or I read this article that told me this, that, and the other, I want you to challenge it. I want you to make sure that you ask the question, is that right for us? Is that right for our customers? Is that going to be the best way that we're able to do something? I want you to learn. I want you to keep attending meetups, obviously. I want you to read books, watch videos, take courses, go to conferences. I never want you to stop as agile practitioners about how you can learn, how you can grow, how you can keep innovating yourselves. I want you to experiment. I want you to try new things. Uh, I want you to innovate and I really, and really know why one thing is better than the other. One thing that uh, I got challenged on quite recently and I, I thought this was uh, it kind of certainly shook my view was why can't we estimate in time rather than estimating in story points? And I was shocked. I was like, fuck, like, no way. You kind of like time is evil. It's horrible. My experience tells me this. But actually, if they were to experiment and one was better than the other, like, what if I'm wrong? The kind of that experimentation and having, you know, proof is in the pudding, I think is very valid. But having the data kind of behind it and trying different techniques you know, to figure out what works for you in the context of your team, in the context of your customers, in the context of, of what you're trying to achieve. Don't kind of fit, you know, one size doesn't fit all, certainly. Keep an open mind. Uh, you may have your favorites, but being open to other ways of doing things, I think, is incredibly important. Um, even in the, uh, you know, State of Agile kind of report, 
it talks about how you know safe and scrum uh, is kind of 80 to 85 percent of the overall respondents preferred methodology you know that means that some but it means that they're identifying as scrum but what if there's something better what if there's a tweak in there that they have made and they're not kind of calling it out because they're too afraid of being uh you know not fitting that checkbox on the kind of report really interesting so keep an open mind think about the different things that are going on think about the opportunities that you have be agnostic um i think this is probably the the most important one for this is agile as a culture and a philosophy and it's ultimately a set of values if you think about the original agile manifesto it is a series of values it doesn't talk about any specific methodology and that ultimately implies that there are lots of different ways of being able to do it and it should be about the context that you're in there are lots of ways to achieve the things that you're trying to achieve don't be limited by a single methodology or more and lastly uh, and probably equally as important as the last one think about the context what does your team need what does your company need but most importantly what does your customer need and how best can you achieve that Something that it took me a, a quite a few years after discovering, you know, Agile and Scrum and Kanban and Lean and you know all the other kind of wonderful methodologies that we're all here kind of around about, um, you know, was there is a place for waterfall. There are projects that waterfall is more suited to, and actually there are things that I can take from waterfall and, and Scrum and Agile and merge them all together and find a really incredible way of doing things. But I didn't think about the context for quite a few years. I was like, oh no, I can't, I can't use that. It's, it's old, it's, it's horrible, it's nasty. Like we don't do that anymore, we're agile. But it's kind of feeding into that thing of you know, perception rather than about need and about context. So think about your context. What is gonna change between now and in six months time? Um, in six months time, you shouldn't be doing the same thing anymore. It should be different because you're certainly not working on the same thing. Your customers have evolved and changed and their needs have changed. Why haven't you changed? And lastly, I want you all to think about your skills as very much as a toolbox. How do you build it and how do you use it? One of the analogies that I love to use uh, kind of on people that, that are kind of part of my team is, you know, imagine you've got a toolbox, you've got wrenches, you've got hammers, you know, kind of vis-a-vis -vis it's uh, lean, scrum, agile, waterfall, kind of whatever it is. How do you use them and how do you gain that experience and how do you keep filling your toolbox? because the context is always gonna change. Change is always gonna come. So how can you always kind of keep that toolbox full? How can you try new things and how can you keep evolving that? Think about your skill set very much as a toolbox and how you keep building it. Thank you very much. So I think that's me two beers in. So uh, I'll stop talking now and uh, pass over to Jonathan. Thanks, Nick. You definitely promoted some healthy discussions in the in the chat. I was really oh, happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, by the way, um, other panelists, if you want to, to jump in at any point and ask some questions, um, but we have a, a question from Hamid. He thinks, do you think Agile is still relevant in the age of Scrum? Yeah, absolutely. I think Agile, um, if you imagine in your head, uh, kind of like layers, Agile is at the very bottom. It's that um, philosophy, the philosophy values, um, the frameworks that layer on top are the ways that you achieve that. And I think that that bedrock of agile, um, you know, customer first, you know, thinking about value, and even back to that original quote about, you know, flaccid scrum, you know, the emphasis in there is not about necessarily the process and doing the process wrong, although I'm sure it was definitely a way of, uh, you know, ensuring that there was plenty of people that signed up to scrum training courses, but the emphasis in there is about the customer, the value that you delivered, the iterations that you delivered, the experimentation you delivered. So I absolutely, I think Agile at the core of it is that's what it's representing. So yeah, I, I really do. Cool. Um, just before we wrap up, just want to make sure um, no more questions. Do any of the panelists have any questions you'd like to ask Nick? I can throw um, one question out there for you, Nick, is, um, you know, with a lot of those types of practices um, that get uh, that are out there, like, for example, story points, I often with a lot of organizations um, run into uh, where where many organizations want to start codifying these things like story points or scrum or certain things as a matter of 
corporate policy to say, oh, let's standardize the story point, or let's say all teams must have a daily stand up or things like that. Um, how in your experience have you kind of coached organizations away from codifying those practices as a matter of corporate policy? I also have a very good question. It's something that uh, uh, comes up a lot, actually. Like, what's minimum? And uh, when you kind of build these teams, and I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work at uh, a company that is in a, in a very strong uh, arena of growth at the moment. Um, so when we're kind of building new teams and we're trying to build those things out, like what is minimum? Yeah. You think about, well, is that user stories? Is that this? Is it that? And like, what, how do we kind of codify some of those things? Um, but it's very much, I think, the intention and the motivation behind it. Like, is it a bedrock and a foundation to evolve from? You know, mm. is that a, way, a place to kind of get started from? And I think it's about that kind of culture and motivation around it that kind of hinges for that. So in some companies that I've worked in the past and, and certainly as we are now, we think about what's the minimum that you start from and then how do you evolve from that? Um, and I think that, you know, ultimately at the core of it all is what's going to work for the customer. Well, we know these kind of things work because that's the cadence and scale and, and kind of so on. But ultimately it's about that customer and, and forcing that contextual change really helps to shake off that um, being kind of stuck on things. So I think yeah. in summary, it's about what's your minimum, what kind of works, what doesn't work. Does that fit into your, you know, cadence, rhythm, governance, kind of pick your poison for, for, for language um, for the company? You know, how do you make decisions, for example? Yeah. Um, but then after that, I think it's about how do you get the leg up for teams? You know, how do you get them started? And then yeah. post that, how do you keep the, you know, culture of innovation and culture of change and, you know, thinking about context um, how do you kind of put that into all the teams? So it's almost like to kind of have a play, a play on the term, uh, a minimum viable process, as it were. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's interesting because um, Joachim, um, who I, I've met before, talks about the idea of minimum viable agile or minimum mm. viable process. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, if we were to be really honest with ourselves for a second, there is minimums. You know, the idea of autonomy I think is a really interesting one because you know a lot of teams and a lot of people aren't set up to be autonomous they're not capable of doing it so how about we give them a helping hand and say look here's where you start from and then you evolve from there because you'll understand the context a lot more i, yeah. I totally believe in the idea of kind of a minimum agile and a minimum process certainly yeah makes sense strip it down strip it down to its core fundamentals and then layer on what you need yeah yeah it's a good approach Cool. Um, well, I'd just like to um, say a big, big thank you to our three um, speakers, given given up their time um, to to instill wisdom um, up, upon us. Um, so we're really grateful, um, and um, we're we're looking to to get the agile um, roundabouts back. Um, we should have one next month. So watch this space. Um, I'd like to thank you all for for attending, and um, I hope you all have a good evening. And I hope to see you all very soon. See you soon, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, ditto. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot. See you soon.